Good morning from Kigali, Rwanda. To all our viewers, you're welcome to our channel. I hope you're all in good health and keeping safe. I'll be the moderator of this panel. My name is Michelle Umurungi. I'm the Senior Strategy and Policy Analyst at Rwanda Finance, a co-organizer of this event. On this panel with me, I have the great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests. To my right is Mr. Olivier Mugawonake, the CEO of Ad Finance, a fintech in the microfinance industry. Next to him is Mike Ndimurukundo, the Managing Director of Andela, a company that builds and helps manage remote engineering teams. Last but not least, Dr. Edward Kadozi, the expert on capacity building in the Chief Skills Office at the Rwanda Development Board. Now, before I get into this conversation, I would like to give a little bit of context. This year, the Singapore FinTech Festival brought together the global FinTech community to discuss different topics, one of them being talent development. So the theme of this year's event, People and Talent, which is also the topic of our conversation, um, is really relevant during this global pandemic. And although the global pandemic has underscored the need for innovation and more importantly, digitization of financial services, we know that most companies depend a huge deal on their workforce. And that is no exception to fintechs. Talent is indeed crucial to their survival. So on this panel, we will explore the national level response on to upskilling and reskilling the fintech force, the needs and skills gap in the fintech industry, some of the initiatives um, for talent development and how to effectively bridge this skills gap, and inevitably the impact of COVID on talent development. So to get this conversation started, I'll start with Mike. Mike Ndimurukunda, welcome to our session today. Can you share with us um, what your view on the current landscape in Rwanda's tech force looks like? Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, the view of the talent, uh, when you look at Rwanda, when you look at where we are, um, it's really, oh, it's on. My bad. Okay, this is much better. Um, the view of the talent landscape in Rwanda um, is really improved compared to where it was a few years ago. Um, you have a young force that is um, aware of the skills and what is available. Uh, you have people that, you know, they're millennials. Um, and then the other thing is the skills that they have at the moment can be able to compete at a global level. Um, COVID brought all this out, uh, exposed it, but you have people who are coming up with products, coming up with setting up companies, fintechs, uh, technology companies, and I believe uh, we are on the right track. Thank you, Mike. Um, so since you've talked about the workforce in general, in tech, I'd like to turn it over to Olivier. Olivier, I want you to narrow it down specifically to fintech. What is the current landscape of the fintech workforce in Rwanda? Well, um, I said, um, Mike, we have seen an improvement, an, a huge improvement of the workforce uh, skills and quality in the last uh, uh, five years. Um, now, the most important thing is to be able to, to learn and to, be, to adapt to the new technologies. Now, now these technologies we are using uh, were not there 10 years back or five years back, so we need to have this force. The, 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 the fact of having um, young talents out there who can catch up and learn and um, build on uh, uh, needed skills is very important. Um, Specifically, what, what I'd say what is needed in the, f in the fintech uh, area, we have those hard skills, uh, including uh, software development, like uh, programming skills, uh, using uh, latest technologies like uh, JavaScript, uh, Java, uh, Python, and so on. Um, when it comes to fintech, uh, there is a very important part, which is the 
cloud computing and cyber security uh, because delivering financial services obviously goes through uh, exposing uh, critical information data on uh, in, uh, on the uh, on the net and uh, this cyber security is a very important uh, part of the skills we, we need uh, there is also this uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning which is very critical in fintech uh, with uh, in applied fields uh, like uh, which has applied like in uh, anti-money laundering, uh, customer mm -hmm. uh, behavior prediction, uh, and um, uh, other st other st stuff that needs to, to learn to, to use the, like, uh, the machine learning to, to, to improve products. But most importantly, there is um, something young talents out there probably I ignore, is that in FinTech, it's not only about technology, it's also about financial skills. Uh, and uh, most importantly, the um, soft skills. Soft skills like uh, uh, communication, problem solving, uh, critical thinking. So those kind of skills are really necessary and at the end of the day, they are those which make difference between a successful and uh, a, a non-successful company. Thank you, Olivia, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. Um, soft skills are indeed an essential uh, skill set mm -hmm. if you are to build a fintech company that will endure and uh, last for a couple of years. Yeah. Let me take it over to Edward. Edward, good morning. good morning. We've heard from the private sector, from Mike, from uh, Olivier as well. I would like for you to share your views from a government agency perspective. What do you think of the current landscape? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I think for the interest of our global audience, uh, allow me to first establish the background of all the current landscape we are talking about skills. Sure. I think we, here we are talking about Rwanda, and Rwanda that is a country that was affected by genocide against Tutsi. If you look at the data after 1994, 10 years after, you are talking about just almost no skills. Mm. <laughs> and the ones that were there were affected and you had uh, almost outflow of skills again. So the 10 years after the genocide, you could see that the th skills you could think about were not there. And then you think about other 15 years after, then that's where you can start thinking about and trace the landscape of skills in Rwanda. So when you talk about the landscape of skills, you also talk about the environment, the policy framework, the institutions, that put in place all this uh, labor force or critical mass of human capital. That's where you see things getting in to be in place. You see institutions being put in place to provide these skills, to supply these skills in high learning institution, TVET, and lower education. That's where you see a mass of, rapid mass of skills on, on, on the market. Mm -hmm. Then after, you see also some a bit of harnessing and leveraging on the, the skills required by the market. Uh, then a bit of, after the genocide, there was a bit of trying to put in place the skills to address the, the, the real issues, that, the issues and the crisis. But some years after the genocide, you see a bit of harnessing and a bit of leveraging on the current opportunities, locally, globally, and regionally that to make sure that you are producing skills that are required by the market. So that's where I see a lot of universities, local, international, being put, uh, established in Rwanda and providing these skills. I will share with you the numbers, but let me first also tell you about the policies that were put in place. Education policies were improved. Now we are talking about now skills development and employment promotion strategies that RDB has uh, uh, put in place and is implementing of, of recent. So all these in the policy framework have generated a mass of skills on the labor market. Now, as I talk of mass of skills, I'm talking about over 90, 99,000 skills in different skill sets on the market for the last 10 years. Now, since we are in the 
STEM field and finance, FinTech, here we are talking within the 99,000 uh, capital of skills, here we are talking about 40% of that being in STEM. Now the question you raised about soft skills. The soft skills, but also another challenge as, the, uh, as my colleague said, is the question of skills mismatch. Here you have the suppliers, you also you have the demanders, which is the market, the corporates. So you find that the supply of skills is not in, aligned with the demands of the skills. That's why the corporate are saying, okay, we are not getting the right skills. Then that one becomes an issue, an issue on the market for the case of employment, but an issue to drive the economy. So that one has become a policy issue and the Rwanda Development Board with other stakeholders have been working on this to address these challenges of, of, of skills mismatch. Another thing is on soft skills. Maybe I will also tell you the details about those initiatives later. The soft skills has merged of recent. Some years ago, where the issue was how do you supply skills on the market? Now, you are talking about the skills needed on the market in line with the market demands. Then the soft skills comes in place. So again, in our skills development strategy, so we, have a, we are addressing also that one of soft skills, and I will share with you in the details. So that is the landscape. A lot of skills are coming, generated here locally, but also from abroad. We have a number of diaspora talents that are coming back, and they are helping to address the, to, to, to bridge this skills gap. Thank you so much, Edward, for that really detailed um, answer. And I hear you talk about um, initiatives that you're taking to help this mismatch in um, talent placement. While we're still on this topic, Mike, I believe you have an interest in the functionality of public-private partnerships. So from your experience, are they sustainable? Uh, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, they are very sustainable, and I'm glad that I'm following him because Andela, if you look at Andela, the right. way we are in Rwanda, and the reason why we are in Rwanda is because of having these PPPs in place, is because uh, the government was able to look at the skills gap and say, Andela has something that it can offer. Um, it is among the best in training software developers to match the demand uh, that the um, ecosystem needs. And this is how we are in Rwanda. This is how we are operating in Rwanda. Because uh, the government created that opportunity, that environment, and being able to operate that way. So I believe as a developing country, this is something that is very crucial. Uh, you cannot, you cannot separate the two. Uh, there is a point we will get to, and the private sector uh, will be able to operate on its own, will be able to drive this kind of innovation. But the government and these kind of initiatives, putting PPPs in place, is something that is quite crucial. Correct. Completely agree there with you. Uh, let me go back to Olivier here for a little bit. Olivier, I know we spoke about hard skills and mm -hmm. A lot of times when you talk about talent, we only speak of hard skills. And you touched a little bit on soft skills. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to that. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a gap here with soft skills? And what do you think can be done to address that gap? Oh, well, uh, a very tough one. Um, uh, as I said, the hard skills, uh, anyone can learn a lot, a hard skills. It's something you... It's a matter of time. If you want to be trained in a one given programming language on technology, you take time, you sit down, you, 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 you write the, I mean, you, you take the, the necessary courses and then you can get uh, where you want to be. And now, uh, on the soft skills is something we, we think can be developed through uh, other means. Of, of course, obviously, the, there is. Uh, there, there is a gap in, in, uh, in the soft skills availability. Um, I, I can give you a simple example. The, the when it comes, for instance, for, uh, as we, as software, the, uh, in the software industry, uh, in most cases, sending 
uh, a developer and or, or a software engineer to sell a software is the best way to lose the market. <laughs> because when it comes to communication, we're talking about the codes, we're talking about how they, they how, how how amazing is the architecture or how the algorithm is uh, is uh, is is good, but yet he's talking to someone who is uh, totally ignorant in such kind of technology. And then what he needs to understand is how this is gonna solve my problem. The problem is not how it works. The problem is how can it help me address my problem. So this is a very simple example of, uh, um, uh, of um, uh, how soft skills can be uh, important in, in development of the FinTech. Now, uh, how now to address the gap? I, I think this is something you learn through experience. No one comes with, uh, with, uh, with those kind of skills. There's what you can learn in, in schools. Uh, and when it comes to schools, for instance, what I do recommend is like to have um, like a parallel or, or extracurricular um, uh, like workshops, like at universities, not only focusing on uh, on on, how, on courses, on technical courses, but also like organize uh, uh, events and. Uh, uh, um, critical thinking sessions, like mm -hmm. analytical thinking uh, uh, workshops, and mm -hmm. get our students, our young people out there exposed to how to interact mm -hmm. with others. Because the human being are like that. They, they need mm -hmm. interaction, they need to, to they, they can achieve high uh, mm -hmm. objectives, provided mm -hmm. you, you, you are able to work together. Uh, and secondly mm -hmm. is the experience, as mm -hmm. you as, as the young talents out there mm -hmm. get uh, uh, trained, they go to participate in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they grow in the career, uh, they, they, they learn mm -hmm. by, through experience, and those skills can be, um, mm -hmm. can be uh, acquired through the mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Thank you, Olivier. Okay. That's a great example that you shared mm -hmm. <coughs> to illustrate yeah. the lack of uh, soft skills in, in, mm -hmm. in our market currently. Yeah. Back to you, Mike. I know that you help build and manage talent for remote teams. And a lot of times this has to do with hard skills. How do you incorporate soft skills in your programs? Thanks for that. Um, so the way we built our program is that from day one, we simulate what people are going to be doing in the workplace. Um, so just touching on what Olivia said, um, an example is that from day one, we get our developers to start blogging. We get our developers to start, uh, we force them to communicate uh, in a way that will simulate what they do in the workplace. So even before COVID, we're doing a lot of Zoom calls. We're doing a lot of Slack communication. We're doing a lot of uh, writing so that if you're communicating with someone who's not with you in person, they can be able to see these things. And then, um, Work actually, like you said, workshops on uh, how do you ensure that people are aware and understand what's going on around them and are able to read the room and are able to communicate a certain way. How do you ensure that uh, you build this confidence? So it's not a one-off, um, but it's something that can be ingrained in um, every step of the way. So for example, again, coming back to our program, it's an eight-month program. This is something that is we check on and we work on every week during that whole period. So I would say even for higher learning institutions, like Edward said, uh, if you look at even high schools, this is something we can build in so that people start doing debates, uh, so that people start communicating, start um, you know, getting in front of an audience and being able to pass on a message. Uh, prime them to doing uh, presentations, pitch decks, uh, simulate an environment where they are presenting to uh, um, investors so that they can be able to convince them. The more you do this, we started seeing it um, when, when we started training people. So for example, last year we trained about 130. This year we have, a, we have more than 110 people in the program. You notice a change by the second month in how confident people are, in how people communicate, 
all of a sudden they don't look down when they are communicating, they look you straight in the face and they're able to communicate uh, and articulate their thoughts in a much better way. So it's something you keep stressing with time, um, but also giving them that opportunity to do it. Thank you, Mike. That's wonderful that you do that and incorporate that in, in your programs. So Edward, back to you. While we're still on the topic of soft skills, I really want to hear from you and understand what the Chief Skills Office for, as a government agency is doing to, to make sure that we can replicate what Andela is doing on a national scale. What is the national response um, to upskilling and skilling in terms of soft skills, not just the hard skills? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. I think, uh, uh, let me come back to what Olivier mentioned, the case he provided. Uh, besides my work uh, at Rwanda Development Board, I teach at university, mm -hmm. and then of recent, we kept seeing this challenge of soft skills. So before we introduced some different projects and programs to address this issue, we, we, we did a rapid assessment from private sector and companies to see the skills needs for these younger graduates to get employed. So the findings we saw from the private sector, we, we saw that almost 40% of skills they, they demonstrated that are lacking were soft skills. Mm. So you can see that is a challenge. Mm -hmm. Then what are we, we are doing is one, we have of recent, the government of Rwanda approved a workplace learning policy. That's one initiative that encourages one different uh, components within that policy, but there is one I wanted to say that it say that which improves the, the soft skills chance is in induction attachment, the program of induction, where students from Tibet high learning institutions, they take some time to study in class, but another time they get to go and study at, in, in industry. Mm -hmm. They just go to practice, interact with uh, uh, the realities of the market within companies and the industries. That one improves their soft skills, their communication, presentation, and all this. That's one aspect. Another one is we have just started programs of training graduates now we last year we carried out training in the soft skills of i think around 450 students graduates this year we are continuing with it again specifically on soft skills so then seeing okay is with these projects and programs we are doing as our db chief skills office but also with our uh, stakeholders like candela and others are we addressing the root of the problem? Mm. That's the question we needed to be thinking about. So teaching someone who is a graduate from a university or TVET, is that we need assure that this is soft skills will get it in within two months or three months? Then it remains a question mm -hmm. to think about. Then it comes back to when can we start thinking about this issue of soft skills. Not necessarily thinking about the hard skills in our education ladder. Probably, we need to start thinking about from early education. Not at university, but early education, primarily. Mm -hmm. Secondary schools, as people climb, they also climb the ladder of education, but also they get a chance to study all these things. By the time they get to the market, at least you are sure that they have some base of soft skills. So we are doing a number of this and we are evaluating our interventions. Currently we are rolling out the study to see whether these rapid interventions of soft skills are providing results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Yeah. It's really reassuring to know that we're not only thinking about the hard skills, but the soft skills as well. And I'm glad to know that both the private and uh, public sector are thinking about this. And as you mentioned, it remains a question to be answered. So let's keep this uh, conversation going later. I had forgotten something. Sorry, if I could. Uh, Please. Come in. 
you, you, you asked him, Mike about the PPP. Let mm -hmm. me talk about the PPP in relation to the soft skills. Maybe the rest we shall talk about. I had forgotten it. Mm -hmm. So in these interventions we are doing in soft skills, we are considering also the stake of private sector, corporates, mm -hmm. to come and offer teachings in these trainings. Because we are talking of uh, the, the normal education institution, lecturers and what, again coming to teach these soft skills. But these graduates need some tips from the market. Right. So in that process, we are incorporating the private sector. Mm -hmm. Companies, people like Mike, Olivier, and others coming to also to offer the teaching, uh, teachings and lectures within these trainings and getting time to interact with the graduates to understand the realities of the market. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, to all our viewers online, I hope you've gathered by now that uh, Rwanda does not only think about hard skills, but also soft skills in the fintech space. And it's great to know that um, there is public-private par partnerships on this. I want to quickly segue into interesting statistics. We've talked about the lack of hard skills, the challenges with soft skills, but it's interesting for me to know that in 2015, we only had about five companies, five fintech companies registered in Rwanda. And just last year, we had 44 fintech companies, according to the UNCDF report. And that is quite a surge. So I'll turn to you, Olivier. Could there be a correlation between this surge and the rise of good quality of talent available now compared to the previous years? What do you think? Yeah, definitely, there is a, a correlation between this um, um, increase, the growth of the fintech uh, industry uh, with the availability and quality of, uh, of skills uh, um, uh, available out there. Well, which is normal as well. In 2015, we had, yes, as we said, we had five companies, but we had um, since that time, and today we had new um, uh, universities coming in, like uh, uh, CMU had sent out there some graduates. So we, we have this uh, African Leadership University. We have uh, the um, uh, EMS, African Mathematics Institute. Mm -hmm. Uh, who they, they are running a, 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 a very um, innovative program in machine learning, mm -hmm. probably one of the best, the best in the world, a uh, master's degree in machine learning. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, definitely there is uh, this, as we, we get new uh, skills, uh, skilled people, uh, young, young uh, Rwandans coming back from... Uh, from abroad, uh, a very big number of them came back between uh, that time and now. So as the skills um, improve, mm -hmm. we, the, the, the industry also will we, we improve. And uh, I'd like to add something interesting. Uh, it's ab uh, about um, the more you have skills, the more you grow the, the, the industry in total. Because nowadays competition is not anymore a competition between companies only. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a competition between ecosystems. Mm -hmm. if we, we, when you have like 14 something plus uh, uh, fintech companies specialized in various areas, right? let's say in software development, in a payment system, in cybersecurity. So we, uh, we, 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 this increases the competitiveness of the country uh, as, uh, as a whole. Uh, simply because if today you have like a, 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 an opportunity of a business case in somewhere in Nigeria or in Kenya or wherever, mm -hmm. I cannot have all the required, I may not have all the required skills within my company, but wait, when we have all those uh, other companies uh, growing, I know uh, for this part, I can, I, I know I can do like a, a subcontracting or um, a joint venture with another company. And this is how we, we, we can increase our, our competitiveness in the fintech uh, area. Thank you, Olivier. Okay. I was certainly trying to see the glass, the glass has half full here, and I'm glad that you indulged mm -hmm. uh, me. 
Mike, I want to bounce back to you. The surge in fintech um, companies registered in Rwanda, it, it certainly indicates a growing demand for talent. Mm -hmm. What do you think um, can be done from, uh, the Andela, from Andela's perspective to ensure that this demand is met? Uh, thanks for that. So from our perspective, it's making sure that this demand in tech talent, um, all these engineers have a solid foundation. Because if you uh, think back to what Olivier talked about when he started, there's a diverse skill set that is needed for fintech companies. You know, you need machine learning engineers, you need um, cybersecurity engineers, you need um, software developers, you need people who will do some blockchain, do different things. What happens with all of them? They need a strong base in software development skills. And at least for us, that is what we are uh, working on and that is what our focus is, to make sure that everyone who goes through our program is able to adapt. Uh, you will have some who end up being data scientists, you will have some who end up being machine learning engineers, we have people who completely change and pick up new languages and as the, as the ecosystem they're a part of and as the demand um, shows it. And you also talked about something, you know, creating ecosystems um, of innovation. Um, it, it touches on what uh, Edward talked about, uh, the PPPs in place, uh, what the government is putting in place, what RDB is putting in place, what the private sector is bringing in, what the higher learning institutions and, um, are bringing in and a company like Andela, being able to bring it all together. And as a result, not only are Randy's companies going to come up, but all of a sudden, an American company, another company in Nigeria, another company in India, in Asia, is able to look at Rwanda and say, okay, all the policies and everything else is in place, but there is also technical talent that we can be able to leverage. Um, and to me, again, it starts with uh, the universities, what we are doing because we are complementing what the universities are doing. Correct. And as a result, Olivier is able to get talent that is ready for the market. Mm -hmm. At what scale are you complementing what the universities are doing? Um, because we're, we're seeing here a quick surge mm -hmm. and it's pretty, it's ever increasing. <laughs> there is no going back. Yeah, there's definitely no going back. So um, our mandate is every year to train about 100 developers. Um, last year, we did that with about 130. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, we currently have more than 110 in the program. Um, and the plan is to continue doing this and uh, growing this as we move forward. Thank you, Mike. Edward, I'd like to... Uh direct to you this question while we're still on this topic about the surge in, in the rise in demand for um, good quality talent in the fintech space do you think that there's a need in the future to incorporate fintech educational courses in our curriculum thank you very much i think you are raising a very interesting point <laughs> i think if we don't consider integrating fintech within our education curriculum we shall be missing because the, the the current reality is this whether we want or not we are heading into a global sorry a digital age in all spheres of life mm -hmm. economy health everything so fintech uh, it fintech will have to be part of our life and it has to be studied let me first share with you, if you look at the numbers, you find that one of the, again, one of the, the issue of skills mismatch in another way. When you see the, the technicians, the IT developers and everything that are coming out, you find this gap where you find this good innovator. He can innovate a number of products and put out them there out, but the aspect of knowing another part, how do I address the issues of finance? Mm -hmm. How do I build my company to attract investors, either joint or whatever, or to attract fun, fun, funds? You find that these good innovators miss these, the, the, these skill sets. So then 
if we were to think, then you would think, then how can would this be addressed? The, que the first thing is to integrate them in our curriculum. So we, we are used that in, uh, at our universities, if you are studying sciences, then it, it will be in your course, just go through all this. Right. But we needed to think how we integrate this. And the way we are doing it, we are considering it as Chief Skills Office and RDB. Mm -hmm. We are now partnering with the private sector. We have set up uh, under the, the, the strategy I, I mentioned earlier, we are working out a framework. We, we are calling uh, sk uh, sector skills councils. Mm -hmm. The sector skills council framework aims at bringing the industry, academia, the government to discuss about the skills required on the market, but also to identify the skills needed, define also which skills that are required. Mm -hmm. For example, if now we are working with the uh, finance sector to come up with skills, uh, sector skills council for finance sector. And these are the discussions we are conducting, we, we are calling out right now to see, okay, if we, we come up with this framework where we have the private sector, we have the government, we have the academia, and we are discussing on the skills required in the sector, but also influencing the curriculum development mm -hmm. all the way from secondary to university. In that process, we are sure that the Finitech aspect is integrated within the discussion, within the curriculum. And that's the future we are looking to. So that's the, the most important thing we are discussing on. So, but also, besides that, we, every year we conduct what we call sector skills audit mm. to, to assess the skills needed on the market. And then when we do that, we also consider the finance sector, the FinTech as well. Mm -hmm. So that, what, those findings help us to influence to inform policies, to inform the curriculums with the education sector. Thank you, Edward. I like that that conversation is ongoing. And I know that we like to model ourselves against Singapore. And I know that this is something that Singapore has done. And they've incorporated FinTech courses in their curriculum. Without being too optimistic, do you think that this is something we can expect to see in, say, the next five years? It's because the discussion is going on. Mm -hmm. However, it will not be one size fits all. <laughs> I, th I think as an economist, you have to think about that. Mm, Which local demands do we need mm -hmm. as, as our economy is growing? Because let me tell you one thing is that skills need are informed by the trends and the path of the economy. And our economy are going digital. Because you, I earlier mentioned about the skills demand, maybe in FinTech and other areas, we have to be sure, uh, informed that the demand for skills is always informed by the path of the economy, how the trends of the economy is growing. And if you look at the Rwanda's economy and even the region, the economy is going digital in finance, in other parts of the economy. So that pushes the demand for these people. Correct. So I think with the, recent, the, the, the current pandemic demonstrated that we need IT, the innovators, to be able to address the, these problems we are facing of pandemic, and we are able to address this with right. the, the tech, but also working with the, the finance sector. So I think we need that, and the discussion now that is going on is how to bring the finance sector together with the academia and, and the government to really inform which curriculums we will need in the, in the near future. Right. And uh, the good thing is the discussions and the products are coming out. Correct. What I'm getting from your response is that we can, we can be optimistic and uh, hope that in the next five years we'll start to see the local curriculum integrating some fintech courses. Mm. Speaking of the pandemic, I'd like to, uh, I want to touch on the impact of COVID on talent development. And here I'll come back to you, Olivier. As the CEO of a fintech yourself, can you briefly tell us how this pandemic has affected your workforce? Um, well, I think the 
fintech industry and the tech industry in general um, was is one of the sectors which were not really negatively uh, were, were, which were not negatively affected by the pandemic. I think that the most the biggest change uh, is we learned to to work remotely. We used to go in uh, offices and. Uh, when it comes to discuss with uh, our customers, we used to travel and, uh, and, uh, and take planes and uh, whatever. But nowadays, they <laughs> it's funny, but one of the goods of the, the, of the pandemic is that even our clients who are not tech driven are now accepting to, to have um, uh, like virtual meetings and uh, demos mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. We, we, since the pandemic, we've been, uh, we, we used, I used to travel a lot before the pandemic. Now it has been a year, I never taken a, pl a plane, but I still do uh, business in, uh, in some other countries. Right. We, we, yeah, so it uh, positively impacted the way our workforce drive. We, uh, our, 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 we, 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 we learned to, to let our uh, employees to work from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also at the same time, the uh, the, the the customers are now uh, much more educated in the in the way we can work uh, together. So uh, globally, I'd say it was um, a good opportunity to, to to reinvent ourselves, to reinvent the way we work, and uh, in a better way than before the, the pandemic. Right. And what I gather here is that for your workforce, it wasn't really a, a big adjustment here. Yeah, uh, definitely, it was a good adjustment. And, and I think also for the, the benefit of the workforce themselves, instead of uh, wasting uh, uh, two hours in traffic jams and, right. and so on, they can be uh, even more productive than they used to be in mm -hmm. before. So Mike, I know you already prepare um, teams to work remotely. Mm -hmm. If you're an engineer in Rwanda, you can work for a big tech firm like Google. Mm. Is there any other adjustments that you had to make because of COVID? Uh, yeah, we had to make a lot of adjustments. So like you said, we've always, at Andela, we've always prided ourselves to being a remote first company. Um, COVID showed us that as much as we've trained our people, our staff, our engineers to work with remote companies, there's so much to do in terms of infrastructure. Because our model before is we had offices um, where, you know, great working spaces, excellent internet. Uh, so you create this environment um, that people come in and they can work remotely with, any, with uh, people who are in different geographic locations. However, with COVID, someone, an engineer who uh, normally would come to the office and be there from 8 to 5, all of a sudden has to work from his room at home. Um, so there was a lot of adjustments in ensuring that they have the right infrastructure. Um, the advantage we had here in Rwanda is that, of course, there's a lot of work, again, that uh, the government and different players have done to make sure that inter there's excellent internet in, uh, across the city, across the country. Um, so it was that adjustment, making sure that people have the right work tools, have um, you know, the right furniture. You know, they have a table, they have a chair that they can use. Um, that was an easy to do in the first few weeks of the lockdown mm -hmm. because there was only, you would talk to an ISP provider and they tell you that they only have one car that is servicing all of Kigali. Mm -hmm. So it was those kind of adjustments, but the moment the infrastructure was in place, the moment the right environments were created, um, our productivity picked up, um, you know, we really didn't miss a bit. As a result, Andela as a company globally has gone remote, 100%. Um, it's only the office in Rwanda that still has an office location because of what we're doing, because of the fact that we are delivering these trainings and we need, uh, and we have a PPP in place with the government. But the rest of Andela has gone fully remote. And our clients uh, globally are thanking us for it and have actually started coming to Andela for sort of like thought leadership. How do you... How, you know, do you ensure that people are productive? How do you make it uh, very engaging? Um, so I would say COVID is one of those that really stressed and reminded us that we need to be resilient.
Um, so I feel like it strengthened us in that way, but also in particular with a program here in Rwanda. Um, of the 130 people that we trained last year, all of them were based in Kigali. Today, of the you know, 100 plus uh, that we have, 35% are outside of Kigali. Okay. This is not something that would have been possible if we're offering the training in our physical location because people would have to move to Kigali. But right now, you have someone who's learning from Rusizi. You have someone who's learning from um, Rubavu, all these different places. The only adjustment we had to make is, okay, do we have the infrastructure in place? How do we get a laptop to them? How do we make sure they have all the tools that they need? So it's, I would say it's a good adjustment. And um, 2021 will be a much better year. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Love to hear that you're truly embodying being a remote yeah. um, company, a company that builds remote engineering teams. That's great to hear. Edward, back to you. How do you think the... Uh, global pandemic has changed your approach as a government agency on the national um, response for talent development? Were there any adjustments that you had to make in your strategy? Um, how is that going for you? Thank you very much. <laughs> I think the pandemic has really changed even the way we have been thinking and doing things. Mm. And, uh, and I always hear that people say, oh, the pandemic has been bad. Yes, it has been bad, but it has even taught us to think, to be proactive and address these issues. Before the pandemic, almost our skills development interventions were physical. Right. Whether the ones we conduct here in Rwanda or the people we send abroad to go on the study. But after, as the pandemic <laughs> evolved, we had to change the way we think and to adapt. And the, the adoption was to go virtual. So the government and with, uh, with RDB had to think about the other virtual interventions that could continuously improve the skills development. One was Coursera, and we are, have been engaged with a program Coursera, which is an online program that uh, has been teaching all people from the government and private sector. And we have seen enormous registration and uh, really people will continuing the program. And uh, they are succeeding with the program. Mm -hmm. So I think over the last five months, we have over 6,000 people finishing the courses using Coursera and other trainers using LinkedIn also has helped us in the area of disseminating information to our job seekers but also trying to match talents with the, 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 the available jobs. We now our trainers whether locally or abroad had to go virtual and we have been implementing this including our local stakeholders now we are, all our trainings are virtual, and we are seeing a lot of success into that. So I think, as Mike said, we will see more of progress, but also the, the efficiency in our economy mm. as we go virtual, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Thank you, Edward. On that note, while we're still in a, um, talking about great progress and improvement um, in our work force, I'd like to conclude this session, this panel discussion for now, so that we can see if there is any Q&A, um, any questions coming from our online uh, audience attending this session. So I'll wait for a few minutes to see if we can hear from our audience online. It seems like we're, you are very clear and there were no questions uh, for this panel. So I'd like to thank you for um, taking the time to be with us today to talk about people and talent in the FinTech, which is a crucial, as I mentioned earlier, part of companies. Companies do depend on their workforce to scale, to continue to grow. So as we've heard, um, the pandemic has not had quite a negative impact. And on the contrary, 
everyone has learned to work remotely, and we're reinventing the way that um, people are working, especially in the fintech industry. It hasn't been quite an adjustment. So thank you so much, dear panelists. It was a great joy to have you, and we welcome our MC to cue us into the next session. <laughs>